This is the home of Lyman Hoyt, a founding member of the Liberty Party for the abolition of slavery. Hoyt played a key role in the escape of slaves through Jefferson County. The Ohio River, of course, divides Indiana from Kentucky, and during the mid-1800s, that separation included the institution of slavery. Indiana was a free state, Kentucky a slave state, and Madison was located at the very cusp of the opposing systems, and it became a safe haven for escaped slaves running from oppression. Jefferson County's abolitionist movement started very early in this area, partially because of the location, and that's the Ohio River had the big influence of when it started. We were so close to the pro-slavery life, which was just across the Ohio River into Kentucky, that people began to try to get away from the horrible life they had of, of, of slavery. And so they tended to start trying to get across that river as much as they could and as fast as they could. The abolitionist movement wasn't something that just started one day. It was something that grew out of individuals moving into the valley and into Madison and seeing the inequities of not only free blacks but then the slaves that were living across the river. As soon as people started moving into the state, you had the abolitionist movement growing. When they started taking that step towards illegal actions, it's around 1820. It continued on until the end of the Civil War. Free blacks migrated to Madison, Indiana and to Jefferson County because there was a huge movement in the state of Virginia that they said they were going to have to go back into slavery if they did not leave there within a year. So they were looking for places to, to move to and their way of traveling was the riverways. So Madison is a natural little spot on the Ohio River that has a good landing and it was just beginning itself to be developed. And so it was a good area that they were accepted and they started coming here. We were lucky to have them here. And we would, and this is why I think our, our whole Underground Railroad movement in Jefferson County is so huge, was because of the free blacks that were in the downtown area. Well, individuals who were um, working on what we call the Underground Railroad, which is um, moving, helping slaves move out of slavery into freedom, which was um, a federal offense. It was against the 1850 um, Fugitive Slave Law as well as the 1793 Fugitive Slave Law. So individuals were helping slaves move through the state, which would have been a federal offense. Neal's Creek Anti-Slavery Society is a wonderful group of people and they came here as early as the 1820s. They started, uh, first of all, having runaway slaves coming across the Ohio River. And they were getting help from this area from, from people and it would be food or um, overnight stay with them if they needed to do that or clothing if they needed to have extra clothing given to them because they were coming from a very warm climate and going north where it was going to be very cold. So uh, this is how that started with just a casual helping of the, of the runaway slaves. So they started in the kitchen of James and Lucy Nelson and um, they ended up um, having that whole concept of the Neal's Creek Anti-Slavery Society starting in their kitchen. Well, Eagle Theory and College is an, um, a branching out of beliefs by the Neal's Creek Anti-Slavery Society. Um, they believed education was important and they believed that everybody deserved education. And so what they did is educated men, women, whites and blacks in the same room. They would um, educate individuals no matter how long they were going to be there and no matter their age or gender or race. The thing that they did though is they moved their principles one step further and many of the individuals who were affiliated with the college started participating in the Underground Railroad. Well, Madison and its attitude towards slavery and actually free blacks in general was I think no different than the rest of um, Indiana. You have a lot of people living in these areas who don't care. They don't care what happens to the blacks, don't care what happens to the slaves. It's not a part of their lives. They don't want to participate. Uh, most people aren't willing to break the law. 
And so people in Madison were no different than anywhere else. Um, the vast majority were prejudiced. Um, they approved the um, changes in the, con the state constitution that didn't allow for blacks to vote, blacks to um, participate in the militia, participate in court cases where there was a person who was a white person of the party. So while they may have been anti-slavery and think that slavery is wrong, they were still very prejudiced, very racist towards the blacks living there. Georgetown is a section of downtown Madison, and when it started, it was not in the city limits of Madison. It was considered north of Madison. And most of those uh, African-American families came from Virginia. So they came very quickly to that area and built beautiful homes that are still standing in downtown Madison. And they became very active in helping their fellow men who were trying to run away still to do that. I arrived in Madison City, Indiana on the 15th of July, 1836, weary in mind and body, but joying in my escape from tyranny and persecution. My funds in pocket amounted to one dollar, which I advanced for my board. I sought employment immediately, carrying the hod for a dollar a day. This, of course, was new and rather severe labor for me at the time, but it was far better than toiling in the cotton or corn field for a reward of a scanty meal of corn and the lash. My freed spirit could now sing a new song where there were no wailings nor cries of anguish. I could go and come as I chose. Lesson my maker for this dear gift of liberty and release from cruel torture, William Anderson. there was the suspicion and the knowledge that runaway slaves were being hid in this area. Mobs were composed of the Knights of the Golden Circle, who were the precursors to the Ku Klux Klan. Wright Ray, the sheriff from Kentucky, also former slaves who were interested in finding runaway slaves because this was a part of their occupation. This is how they made money. This is how they survived and took care of their families, they would come into the home and begin their search. And their search was all about finding runaway slaves. Helping a slave to freedom was stealing property. I do know that blacks were beginning to say, we have got to help ourselves somewhat. So they started to have meetings and conventions to study the whole problem of how they could help their fellow men get out of slavery. Sometimes churches and religious things developed from their meetings. One was the African American Episcopal Church, which is, we have one in downtown Madison, and uh, that was uh, one way that they could communicate and, and help their fellow men. The Masonic Lodge was a way for them, for the free blacks to again have an organization that they could share with one another and be a part and start a community feelings together. And we did have one of the earliest ones in downtown Madison. State of Indiana had numerous ones and, and it was a way for them to even communicate with the Underground Railroad. Anti-slavery societies that were created um, throughout the United States started pretty early and Indiana was a little bit later. In the 1840s we were able to get a statewide convention where individuals would, could come together and um, express their beliefs, learn from other people who had the same values and same beliefs against slavery and it was a, it was a good way for people then to go back home and take new tracts, new written documents and new ideas back to their community and hopefully influence more people. Um, on about the evils of slavery. Another unique feature about the railroad, Underground Railroad here in Madison, if you were to look at, uh, at a map and you, you take your hand, you'll notice that there are several routes coming out of Madison that you would go out through Hanover, you go up top of her hill, you would go over through Ohio, you go to the Levi Coffin House, etc. Madison was a hub. Madison played an important role. Most of the times they came across in what they called John boats or small flat boats. That was the way they basically could get from Kentucky over to Indiana. 
And I think all of us know that once they got here, and, and of course getting up to this point, they walked and they walked and they walked. Very rarely did they have an opportunity to ride in a wagon or any other type of, of, of transportation that would make it easy for them. Madison was one of the places that you could come into. It had a free black community living there where an individual could come in, get some food, some rest, and kind of maybe figure out where they're going to go from there. And then a lot of the individuals um, living in the Madison area are influencing and knowing other people throughout um, the United States and throughout Indiana. And so we don't have people just in Madison just being on their own. They were not in a vacuum. They understood the kind of the greater cause and they were working to help um, with that greater cause. In order to let the slaves know what was going on, what they needed to do, where they needed to meet, uh, the direction to take, different signs, symbols, codes were used. Chapman Harris was a blacksmith. He came to Madison from Virginia, a freed slave. Then he would hammer out on his anvil the um, uh, code by which slaves knew that they could get off the keelboat and come on land. Lyman Hoyt uh, was an outstanding man. I always look at him and think of Lyman as very, very intelligent. And he moved into Jefferson County in uh, the 1830s. And when he came here, he um, immediately was a leader in the fight for freedom for the black people. And he did it in many, many ways. He took a huge stand in the Madison Courier by writing this very large article against the 1850 slave law, which said anybody living in Kentucky or South could come across and, cl and claim any black person they wanted and say was their slave, and they could take them back into slavery. And George de Baptiste was one of the most outstanding free blacks that came into our area. So he started working on the boats called a roustabouts, I believe is a term that they use sometimes. So he began to communicate with like Levi Coffin that was over in Cincinnati, and if you go even further north of that, you run into John Rankin. So all these people that were doing the Underground Railroad, they all started to communicate with one another. So George de Baptiste then started to bring anybody that wanted to get out of slavery, he would help them. I received word from George de Baptiste of Madison, Indiana, that there would be a lot of 10 to leave Hunter's Bottom on Sunday night and he wished me to make arrangements to transport them on the underground road that I was acquainted with. After dark, I drove to the place agreed upon to meet in a piece of woods one mile from the town of Wirt. I had been at the appointed place but a very short time when Mr. de Baptiste sang out, Here is $10,000 from Hunter's Bottom tonight. A good Negro at that time would fetch from $1,000 up. We loaded them in, drew down the curtains, and started with the cargo of human charges towards the North Star. John Tibbetts. Delia Webster was an abolitionist in our area. Delia Webster owned a free labor farm in Kentucky. And that free labor farm was burned several times. The free labor movement encouraged people to purchase products that were produced by free slaves, by free labor. It encouraged people to partake of products, articles, grains, and farm items that you would normally have purchased from a, a slave owner. This particular thing was something that Delia Webster was involved in. Later she was arrested and went to jail because of her activity with the Underground Railroad movement. But she was a very strong, bold, white lady that did not mind helping the slaves. Well, bounty hunters were important on the Underground Railroad because if you didn't have someone chasing you, there wouldn't be a need to continue traveling outside of you know, Indiana. If you're a f um, slave living in Kentucky and you know that once you get to Indiana, no one's going to follow you, then you don't have to go any further than that. But because you have individuals like Wright Ray and other bounty hunters who were making more money capturing one slave than you would ever, cap than you would ever make as a farmer in one year, it was well worth them to hunt you down. Sheriff Riot Ray was one of the most 
outstanding characters for pro-slavery in our county of Jefferson County. And he did a lot of things that we would look at today as being very negative and not a good thing. Um, Riot Ray would make trips out to, to the village of Lancaster to kind of harass the people out here because he knew they were involved with the Underground Railroad and he would come and spend all day at their homes to make sure if they are doing something they shouldn't be doing. The bounty hunters were um, the other side of the Underground Railroad. It's what made the Underground Railroad um, necessary, so secretive, because they were looking for individuals. They were um, camping out people's houses, outside their houses, of individuals they knew were um, participating in the Underground Railroad, looking for fugitive slaves. Sometimes they would even um, kidnap free blacks and sell them back into slavery as a way to make money um, and also to terrorize um, the community as to, to not participate. The Underground Railroad was not a bunch of passive Quakers willing to, you know, to, to, to break the law. These people broke laws, did what they had to do to help with freedom. There were guns, there were beatings there on both sides. Um, no one was innocent of the, and, um, from the violence. And so a lot of people participated and did things that maybe they wouldn't have done otherwise, but when you're being chased by a bounty hunter, you do what you gotta do to make sure you and the person you're trying to help is, is safe. Jefferson County, Indiana it was definitely one of the largest Underground Railroad stations and movements in our nation. And they were so successful because of how they set the whole situation up. The riverfront was, you know, was the line and the black people would go over into Kentucky and help them and talk them into moving and, and saying, we can help you. And then they would wait till that evening, get them across, and then they would come out to the counties. It was so well organized and throughout the whole county and you can find routes as the years went by. There would be different people come in and take that place and they'd move the routes if they got dangerous and people were getting caught in that area, they wouldn't use that anymore. So to come through our county and say, this route is the only route they took, you can't do that because they used numerous ones and numerous people were involved, both whites and blacks. And because those two races worked together so closely, is what made this area one of the largest underground railroad operations in our nation. Take my hand, Lord. Walk with me. This is the Georgetown section of Madison where many runaway slaves found a safe haven after escaping from southern masters. And heroes like Frederick Douglass inspired others to the abolitionist cause. But the issue of slavery had reached the breaking point. Northern states wanted to limit the extension of slavery in new federal territories. Southerners wanted to extend slavery to new states in the West. As positions hardened between North and South, Madison, Indiana had distinguished itself as a beacon of hope. 